Hammer of the Scots is a two-player Columbia block war game that depicts the first war of Scottish independence. It brings to life the rebellion of the Braveheart, William Wallace, as he seeks the allegiance of the Scottish nobles to help support his campaign for freedom against the invading English forces. However, the King of England himself, Edward I, will also be after the noble support so that he can crush the rebellion and continue his rule over Scotland. Hammer of the Scots is one of the more accessible war games out there. The rules are not terribly complex at only eight pages long. But it's a very deep, exciting game, and one that even the most hardened of war gamers appreciate. It's a very good game. Let's jump right in. Let's have a closer look at the game Hammer of the Scots. At the start of the year, each player is dealt a hand of five cards, of which they will select and play one of these cards each turn. There are five turns in a single year. The cards players receive are used to give orders to their units on the board, and there are two types of cards in the 25 card deck. There are five event cards which when played, the player simply reads aloud the text and follows the text's instructions. The remaining 20 cards are the move cards that each have a number printed on them. These cards will allow a player to move that number of groups on the board. A group in this game is defined as a group of players blocks together in an area. The group does not have to move as a group though. Blocks can part their separate ways when activated. We'll have a closer look at the blocks now. Each wooden block represents either an individual, for example William Wallace, or an army's unit like the English infantry. All red blocks in this game belong to the English player, and the blue blocks belong to the Scottish player. The first thing worth mentioning about these blocks is that during the game only the controlling player of an army can see what their units actually are. So your opponent will, from the other side of the table, see how many blocks you have located on the board, and where they are obviously, but not who they are. So they have some information, but not all of it. The blocks have printed on one side of them the unit statistics, like the unit strength and combat rating, which both come into play during the battles. I'll touch base on those a little bit later. The movement rating is printed on the lower left hand side of each block. Most blocks will have a movement rating of 2, although a few of them in the game have a movement rating of 3. The movement rating simply indicates how many areas that block can move through when activated. There are limitations on the board though. The coloured borders, which separate the areas from one another, limit the amount of units that can cross over them from the play of a single movement card. Now, there are a few ways to achieve victory in Hammer of the Scots. However, I'm only going to touch base on the main objective of the game, and that is to control the majority of nobles at the end of the game. Nobles are just like a normal block. During the game, they act like an army's combat unit fighting for the controlling player's side. The game, however, includes two blocks for each noble, with the exception of one, who is always loyal to his homeland. So, for each other noble, there is one block for the Scottish player, and a duplicate for the English player. Only one of these blocks will be on the board at any given time. When the allegiance of a noble changes, the player that just gained the support of that noble replaces their opponent's noble block with the matching one of their own. That noble is now loyal to them, and will fight alongside their other units. With that said, how do you get the support of a noble in the first place? Well, there are a couple of ways. One of which is through battles, and I love the combat system in this game, so let's have a brief overview of the battles now. A battle is initiated when a block or a group of blocks moves into an area containing enemy blocks. Opposing forces can never exist in an area peacefully. It will always result in a battle. The army that moved into the enemy occupied area will be the attacker. The original occupant will be the defender. Here Scotland is defending against an English attack. When it comes time to resolve the battle, both players reveal to each other what units are in that area. For this battle example, I'm going to place them on what's known as a battle board. These are user submitted players aids for the battles that are available as a download in the Board Game Geek forums. Whilst I don't consider them to be truly necessary, they do make the battles easier to keep track of, and for this example it will make the battles easier to follow. Battles in this game are quite simple though. The unit's combat rating here indicates which phase that block attacks in, which is indicated by the letter. All the A blocks will go before all the B blocks, and all the B blocks before the C blocks, and so on. The number next to the letter is the maximum number that unit needs for a successful hit when rolling a D6. The unit's strength, up here, tells you how many dice you get to roll for that unit. The defender always strikes first in battle. Ok, so let's start this battle. The defender's A's will strike first. William Wallace here is at strength 4, and he is an A3. So he will roll 4 dice, and he rolls of a 1, 
2 or 3 are a successful hit. He rolls and gets 3 hits. The English player must now distribute those hits to his force. He does this by reducing the unit's strength, turning the blocks anti-clockwise. If a unit runs out of strength points, it will be placed back into the player's draw pool. In some cases, it could be eliminated from the game completely. The attacking English army have no A's in this battle, so it goes straight to the B's. The defender has no B's, so the English player can use his noble to attack. As you can see, having been wounded by William, his noble is not as efficient as he once was. He is currently at only strength 2, so he will roll 2d6, hoping for 1s and 2s. He gets 1 hit, and William's strength is reduced. The C's now attack, and we start with the defender. The Scottish player rolls 3d6, hoping for 1s or 2s, and he gets 3 hits. The English player assigns 1 to his noble, and chooses to remove the English infantry block here with the remaining hits. So they actually die before being able to make their attack. Having no D blocks at all, a new round will be fought, beginning with the A's again. William is slightly injured now, so he rolls only 3d6, again hoping for 1s, 2s or 3s. He gets a hit, and with that, the English noble Angus is defeated. When a noble is defeated in battle, it is removed from the board, and the matching opponent's block now comes into play in the same area that the battle was fought. In this case, the noble Angus will now support the fight for the Scottish player. So chasing down nobles and defeating them in battle is one way of gaining a noble family's support. Once players play their five cards, the current year ends and the wintering phase begins. This is essentially just a clean-up phase. Some of the units on the board will leave for the winter going back to the player's draw pools, and some areas on the board have limitations as to how many units can remain there over winter. Players may also get the opportunity to increase the strength of some units that were wounded in battle, and they can also bring on some fresh units from their draw pool to certain spaces on the board. But one very, very important part of this phase is that each noble in the game, of which there are 14 in total, have an area on the board that they call home. All nobles during the winter will return to their home areas. If their home area is occupied by enemy blocks at this point, that noble automatically defects to their side and players swap out the blocks as required. Players will continue to fight over the control of nobles, attack and defend areas across Scotland and Northern England, until either one of the instant victory conditions are met, or until the end of the ninth year. There is a lot more to the game than I've showed you. For example, players during the battles may voluntarily retreat at times. They may also have the opportunity to bring reserves into battle. Battles also never last longer than three rounds. After the third round of a battle, if the defender still has at least one unit fighting, the attacker must retreat. So battles never feel like they're dragging on in this game. The English also have blocks that represent soldiers from Ulster and Wales. These blocks, however, are not very reliable. There is a chance that they will just pack up their bags and go home at the sign of any real danger. There may also come a time during the game that the Scottish player can crown a king. If the king is ever killed though, the English player will win the game immediately, so there is a slight risk associated with crowning a king. If you'd like to know more about these aspects of the game, the rulebook has been made available as a download from the publisher's website, and as I mentioned earlier, it's only 8 pages long and it's quite easy to follow. There are a few intricate rules relating to some odd circumstances that may arise, but those are made easy enough to refer to if and when the situation pops up. The other components of the game are obviously the painted wooden blocks. These blocks will require stickers to be stuck on them, but it's not a very tedious job, it only takes about 10 minutes. There are also four dice included to resolve the battles, and the map that depicts Scotland and Northern England. This is not a mounted map though, it's not paper, but it's thin card. To my surprise during play, this was never an issue. Of course I'd prefer a mounted board, but it never caused a hindrance at all. A bit of reverse bending after you take it out of the box for the first time, and you'll be up and running without a problem. The 25 movement cards are the source of my harshest criticism. They do not have rounded edges, meaning that creased edges will likely be a problem. A standard euro sized sleeve fits well enough, and in my opinion, it is a must have. Now it's hard to communicate to you the depth and the strategies of this game, because a game system is not a complex one. So from that gameplay overview, it's hard to see how such a simple wargaming system creates such an incredibly engaging and deep game. But that is the brilliance of Hammer of the Scots. It's not overly complex, it's not riddled with rules exceptions or modifiers, and this really allows players to, after the first play, jump right in and start exploring the strategies. 
Now, players in the game will spend a good amount of time hunting down nobles, and because of the fog of war aspect, you may think to yourself that this is made particularly hard. This is where the winter phase plays an important part, because it basically resets the board each year. During the game, it can be easy to lose track of a noble's whereabouts as they move about, retreat and regroup into different areas. But because they go home for winter, at the beginning of every year, you will know exactly where they will be, and the winter phase gives you the opportunity to reassess things with a clearer perspective, and maybe even readjust your tactics for the following year's campaign. The combat system, as I mentioned, I absolutely love. Combined with the fog of war aspect, it can create some very memorable battles. I've seen battles initiated in this game that neither side thought would be of much significance, only to realise after the units were revealed that the outcome of that battle would ultimately be one of the key battles of the entire game. Sometimes you'll initiate a battle and you'll know exactly what you're up against. Other times, you may have been lured into a trap by your opponent. The combat system and the element of surprise is just a very enjoyable part of this game. There is a lot to take into consideration when playing a game of Hammer of the Scots. Things in regards to movement, things in regards to battles, when to retreat, what units work best together, and the list just goes on. It's certainly going to be a case of one play to learn the game, but lots of plays to master it. Like, even when it comes to the more simple aspects of the game, like the card play, there's things to think about there, too. You see, the cards don't just determine how many groups you can uh, move. It also determines turn order, which is very important. Sometimes you'll want to be the first to move, but other times you'll want to go last. The decisions you'll be making throughout the entire game are going to be really tough ones, but understanding the consequences of your actions will not be as a core concept. The flow of the game is actually pretty easy to keep up with, to, to understand. So unlike some of the other war games in my collection, Hammer of the Scots is a game I'm more confident to teach to new opponents. Some of the other war games that I play regularly, I usually play with others who are familiar with them, and in many cases my opponents for those games are the people who taught me the game in the first place. And I'm always hesitant to teach those heavier war games to new opponents. I, I'll be honest, I just find it really hard. But Hammer of the Scots and Julius Caesar for that matter, I'm excited about teaching to some friends of mine because I think they're going to share the same passion for it that I have. I, uh, look, I can't do this game justice in the review. I'm really struggling to summarise my thoughts here. But as a friend of mine recently put it, it's the kind of game that belongs on the pile of games to save if your house were on fire. And I think that's a pretty fitting statement. Thanks for watching this episode of Castelli Reviews and I'll see you all again soon. Which do you think suits my eyes better, Shadow Grey or Ultramarine's Blue? I think Ultramarine's Blue, but uh, Shadow Grey goes better with my outfit.